Welcome to World on Fire podcast. My name is English Schweitzer. Now, in the last episode, we talked about the 8th Air Force and ultimately their decision to enact the daylight bombing campaign unescorted, albeit that's the key point of it, right? So, so it's important to understand the skies over Europe for the U.S. 8th Air Force. It's something that's really too, it's too hard to explain. We discovered the, the why the United States decided to send their bombers into deep penetrating bombing runs that go far beyond why Ira Eckers, uh, the devil shall get no rest memo to Churchill. The industrial might of Nazi Germany was what was truly keeping their war machine alive. It would be impossible to kill the Nazis if they were still producing and innovating for their global war. And as we stated in the last episode, unescorted high-altitude bombing would become one of the deadliest campaigns in modern history. And that is not just for the crews in the skies. It's important to remember. Hundreds of thousands would be displaced and killed because of these bombings directly. By the end, cities in Germany would be smoldering piles of rubble. The bombing runs in 1943 would prove to be some of the deadliest of the war, and even more so, the year of bombing from May of 1943 to the following June 1944 when D-Day took place. However, there would be many missions in between that provides us with an insight to exactly what these bombing runs could turn into. Not only are we going to get into personal stories of the men that were awarded the Medal of Honor from the 8th Air Force, I'm also going to cover one of the deadliest missions during the campaign, the Second Schweinfurt Raid, also known as Black Thursday. And before we dive in, into this any further, I'd like to mention how this episode is going to play out. I kind of fought back and forth, I read a little bit. Um, I, you know, did pre-recordings and I listened to it and I could absolutely bore all of you with the fine-tuned details of the 8th Air Force's logistics and statistics of their campaigns across Europe. For a large majority of us that are interested in the subject, that's not really what we're aiming after. We're, We're aiming for something different. We're looking for a different angle. I feel in a way, by doing that, it'll take away from what I myself am trying to accomplish with this episode, which is to ultimately give a realistic detail of the situations these men were faced with time after time as they basically put into focus how incredibly lucky these men were. Not just if they survived the run, but if they survived the war, right? So, without further ado, let's get into Black Thursday. On October 14th, Thursday, 1943, 291 B-17s would fly from England to Schweinfurt, Germany, where their objective would be to hit the ball bearing factory in the heart of the city. These ball bearings that were produced here were pivotal to the war industry in producing armored fighting vehicles for the Nazis. While a raid on the factory had happened once earlier in the summer, it was now time to hit it again and hit it even harder. Due to the recent defense of the Luftwaffe, these bombers would be escorted to a specific point by American fighters. Once well into Germany, these fighters would break off, leaving the 291 bombers completely alone in enemy airspace. What nobody had anticipated was the reaction of the Luftwaffe. Hundreds of fighters would either scramble or divert to the massive formation of bombers heading towards the factory. The anti-aircraft batteries on the ground were loaded and prepared. As fighters closed in on the bombers, the flak opened up. The bombing run had now turned into a butchering of these B-17s. Now, while bombs would be dropped on the factory... Out of the 219 bombers, 60 of them would be shot down over Germany. 17 would furthermore crash in England, and 121 
with land needing repairs. Only 21 aircraft would come back unscathed. In one day, the 8th Air Force had lost over 600 men in the skies over Germany. And for the factory, the ball-bearing factory, it was out of commission for two weeks. And the Nazis were able, easily able to outsource the product they needed to a factory in Norway. Never impeding their workflow. The men who flew and fought these missions experienced a fight like they have never seen or felt before. Miles above, men made their crews their ultimate duty and went above and beyond. During the two years that the 8th Air Force would bomb Germany over and over again, 17 airmen would receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Hundreds would be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. We're going to cover the brief story of four of the men of the 17th from the 8th Air Force awarded the nation's highest medal of valor in combat. These stories are real, they're gripping, and in most cases, they're depressing. An embodiment of what it means to be an American, Archibald Matthies was born on June 3, 1918 in Stonehouse, Scotland. In his adolescence, he would immigrate to the United States with his two parents, where they would settle down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was out of Pittsburgh that the 22-year-old Matthews would join the regular army on December 30, 1940. Originally assigned as an aircraft mechanic at Mitchell Field in New York, the impending war would ultimately change his route. On December 3, 1941, four days for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Matthews would report to the Flexible Gunnery School at Tyndall Field in Florida, and one year later he would be aboard a vessel bound for England. Coming in as a replacement on, the air, on an air crew can be a damning thing. As the replacement, Matthews knew that he was replacing a man that either met an unfortunate end or maimed to the point to where he could no longer fly. It was here in England where he would be attached to the 351st Bomb Group under the 8th Air Force as an engineer gunner. On February 17, 1944, Matthews would climb into the ball turret underneath his B-17, 10 horsepower. The mission was a daunting one. It was to infiltrate German airspace and then bomb industrial targets in heavily defended city such as Leipzig. Once over the city, the bombers were immediately the target of all Luftwaffe fighters in the sky. A swarm of fighters hammered the formation, including that of the 10 horsepower. Attacking the front of the aircraft, quickly realizing they were in trouble, Matthews freed himself from the ball turret and made his way to the cockpit. Once inside, Matthews could see the truth in their situation. The co-pilot was dead, and the pilot was severely wounded and unconscious. It was at this moment that Matthews would need to make a decision. He could either exit the aircraft or try his luck on the ground in Germany. Or he could attempt to save the crippled B-17. Matthews and the navigator removed the pilot from his seat and sat behind the controls. Never flying a plane before in his life. Once over England, the navigator and Matthews told the remainder of the crew to bail out of the aircraft. After a dozen or so minutes, Matthew's commanding officer came over the radio and informed him that the plane was simply in too rough a shape to land and they shall too bail out of the aircraft. Noting that their pilot was still alive, he made the decision to attempt a crash landing. Refusing to leave their fire pilot behind to die in a fireball crash. Finding an empty field, Matthews gave it everything he had to land the plane as softly as possible. Yet, when the flying fortress touched the ground, it was all it took to seal the fate of everyone on board. The plane simply could no longer withstand the pressure of its own weight due to the damage. It broke apart upon landing, killing all on board. Matthews was 25. William Metzger was not originally going to be a pilot. Born on February 9th, 19, 1922 in Lima, Ohio. Metzger was at the ripe age of 19 when the Empire of Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. 
It wouldn't take him long to enlist in the Army in October of the following year, working in an ordinance at Camp Young in California. Not satisfied, the young Midwesterner wanted something more. He would be accepted as an aviation cadet in March of 1943 and began training immediately. One year later, in March of 1944, he would receive his appointment as a flight officer and would receive his commission as a second lieutenant that same August. The Army Air Forces had no time to waste, and the bomber crews were taking an incredibly high number of casualties over Europe. Two months after commissioning, Metzger would be on his way to England to serve as a co-pilot on board of one of the infamous bombers of the 452nd Bomber Group. On November 9, 1944, Metzger is co-piloting his B-17 towards Saarbrück in Germany. The flak is beyond concerning as the sky fills with blackness. By this point, the Luftwaffe has begun bracketing the bombers with flak. If you can imagine drawing an imaginary box in the sky and then filling it with as much ordnance as possible, that is bracket bombing. To the bomber crews, this is much deadlier than being chased by said flak. And unable to break formation, the bombers have no choice but to fly through the hellish storm of fire and twisted steel. Before they even make it to their destination, Metzger's bomber is crippled. Engines are on fire. There is a fire in the cockpit. The intercom system in the plane is severed, and multiple men aboard the aircraft are injured. The radio operator is severely injured, with his arm amputated above the elbow. Saying the plane is limping to its objective is an understatement. Instead of falling out of formation, Metzger and his pilot, Donald Gott, make the decision to bomb the target and then make their way back to friendly lives in order to save the radio man's life. Once the bombing run is complete, it is obvious that they are flying back to friendly territory. It is obvious that they will not be able to make it back to the remainder of the bombers. The crippled B-17 is now alone and flying back to friendly territory. Once over Allied land, Metzger orders all who can to bail out of the aircraft. They will not need to worry about becoming a prisoner and all leap from the plane. All who bail out will ultimately survive. Metzger and Gott are now fighting the plane, and it's falling apart fast, jolting and jerking back and forth. The two pilots make the decision to lay the plane down in an open field, hoping their actions will not break the plane apart, and they can save their radio operator's life. At 100 feet, the B-17 can take no more and explodes, sending the bomber on a short and direct path to Earth, exploding a second time upon impact and sealing the fate of all three men on board. Metzger would not be the only person to receive the Medal of Honor for his actions during this. Gott would also receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Service had always been in Robert F. Moyer's blood. Born on Halloween Day, October 31st, 1921, in Huntington, West Virginia, he would grow up to be involved with his communities. He rose to the rank of Eagle Scout, in the United States' Boy Scout program. After graduating high school in 1939, Robert enrolled at Virginia Tech, where he would study for the next three years. It was during his time there he would join the Enlisted Reserve Corps on November 11, 1942, and would be called to active duty only three months later in February. After basic training, he would become an aviation cadet in Jackson, Mississippi, but he would actually fail the pilot training. Not so easy to give up, Robert requested to be moved to aerial gunner school. If he could not fly the plane, he would sure the hell fight out of one. He would not only go on to graduate from the gunnery school, but he would also further his training and graduate from navigator school as well. Commissioned as a second lieutenant, he would be sent to the European Theater in September of 1944, a part of the 477th Bomb Group. On November 2nd of the same year, Fulmoyer and his B-17 crew would be a part of a bombing mission over Maersburg, Germany. As usual, the flak and fighters were intense, and Fulmoyer was doing everything in his high power to navigate the plane to their destination. Within an instant, three anti-aircraft shells pierced the armored skin of the flying fortress and exploded, sending shards of steel through the plane. 
the closest to the area of the plane hit was that of Fomoyer in the navigator's seat. Pieces of the shell in the plane ripped through his body. Fomori was now in mortal danger and bleeding profusely. As fellow crew members attempted to ease his pain, utilizing an injectable morphine, he refused to take it, knowing he needed to keep his mental facilities clear so he could properly navigate the plane and the crew to lift him into place in his seat so he could see all of his instruments and charts. It took over two hours for the B-17 to successfully navigate enemy territory and flag finally reaching Allied territory. Once he knew his crew was over the friendly ground and out of danger, he relinquished his duties and asked for the morphine that he had said no to over the past two hours. Within 30 minutes of being injected with the painkiller, Fomori would die of his wounds. Although he died of his wounds, his dedication to duty and to his crew ultimately saved their lives. A wild child from the beginning and the son of a powerful judge, Maynard Smith was born on May 19, 1911 in Cairo, Michigan. Always able to use his father's position of power to get him out of trouble, it is easy to label Smith as spoiled and a bit of a troublemaker. However, his father's power would not last forever and would die of a heart attack when Maynard was 23 and the trouble he had always been running from and escaping was catching up to him quickly. In August of 1942, the 31-year-old would once again find himself in trouble, and instead of jail, he opted for military service where he was inducted into the Army Air Forces on August 31st. Once he completed basic training, he would volunteer for aerial gunner school and pass with high remarks. Almost immediately after graduating, he would be attached to the 306th Bomb Group and sent to Thurley, England to join a bomb crew. The much older Smith was often in trouble and considered stubborn, not getting along with his fellow crewmates. He would eventually be assigned to his first combat mission six weeks later, on May 1st, 1943. Assigned as a ball turret gunner on his first mission, they would be hammered with flak and cannon fire as they made their way across Europe. After seeing how poorly the plane was performing and handling, he decided it was time to get out of the hatch. Unable to use the hydraulic mechanism, he would hand crank the ball turret into position and open to get out. What he would see is that the majority of his B-17 was in flames and breaking apart. Realizing that he would need to abandon the aircraft, a veteran radio operator barreled through the door, grabbing Smith and telling him that they needed to leave now and jump through the waste gunner's window. Smith watched in horror as the man hit the tail of the plane, ripping him into pieces. Realizing his fate if he jumped, he quickly grabbed a fire extinguisher and began to put out the fires. Due to the holes in the plane, it was totally impossible to smother the fire. He finds another crew member on the ground and as quickly puts his parachute on, takes them to the back, and as both of them prepare to jump, he pushes the other man out of the inferno. Yet Smith once again changes his mind, trusting the plane more than himself. He sets out to put the fires out again. He notices fighters trailing the crippled bomber. Smith hastily jumps into the gunner's window and rips shot after shot, dispersing the fighters. He has now exhausted his extinguishers and has resorted to urinating on the fires. Hearing popping and explosion, he realizes the fire is continuing to grow because their munitions in the plane are on fire and exploding. Smith grabs box after box of munitions and throws them out of the plane. It is only then when Smith returns to the fires on board and uses his hands to beat the fire out. Smith does not know it at this point, but both pilot and co-pilot are still alive and are still flying the plane the best they can. Due to Smith's action, the plane is safe enough to land, and it does. All three men on board live. It is concluded that the remainder of the crew that jumped out died. These are four stories of four men, right? And so we, t- we talked about it earlier that each plane carried ten men. So if you can imagine if these were just four guys on a bombing run, different bombing runs, what the hell else was going on inside those planes? 
the summer of 1943 and the year that led up to D-Day was incredibly bloody for the Mighty Eighth. The lives in the air would forever be changed as they fought for their lives. 25 missions. you got to remember, 25 missions meant your tour of duty was completed. did not mean that your war was over. Right, as we learned with the Memphis Bell, um, some of the, the, especially the pilot went back from the Pacific. Now that was his own doing, and that's a totally different story. But it did not mean that you were done with the war. 25 missions did not mean the war was done. They needed experienced pilots. 25 missions meant that you had succeeded in your tour of duty. You would be put on break and you would come back and do another. That would ultimately be bumped up to 35. Um, however, that is a later on down the road. Now, granted, you're thinking of a two-year window. For these guys, they're doing, you know, three bombing runs a week. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But, you know, they're, the, the life expectancy isn't very long. In the next episode, we're going to discuss the outcomes of these daylight precision runs. Are they truly worth it? Are these lives that we are putting at risk, are they worth it? What is the cost of all of this? Are we actually cribbing? As we just found out on Black Thursday, you know, lost a substantial amount of men, close to 600 men, and really didn't even hamper anything. Nothing changed. They just outsourced it. So, what? who actually paid the price for these massive bombing runs that the, the Americans and the Mighty Eighth were doing? And how did it affect those that were on the ground? You know, that's one thing that we haven't talked about is those on the ground that were immediately affected by all of this. We're also going to talk about how this laid the foundation for the bombing in the Asian theater and how the B-29 would raise the fame and become the ultimate tool and would be the carrier of what ended our war. Please make sure you follow us on social media by searching World on Fire podcast uh, or you can look World on Fire, History of the Second World War podcast. Make sure you feel free to leave us a like and review. Uh, give us a rating, uh, whatever platform you're listening to. I will see you in two weeks, and as always, thank you. Talk soon, everybody.